tonight. So we want to greet everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're grateful to the Lord for everyone that's here today. If you have your Bibles, uh, let's go to the 20th chapter of the book of John. to the Lord to see everyone out today that's here and uh, we look forward to uh, really bringing some things out today uh, that will help us and that will uh, my prayers is that we will grow by what we hear today so um, <laughs> what was the nickname that generations have given the disciple Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Isn't that something? Y'all do know that was Bible, right? Like, yeah, that's, that's, that comes from that apostle, Thomas. If you can imagine being one of the Lord's 12 original apostles and for generations and generations to come, you are known as Doubting Thomas and that other people will be referred to by your name, just like Jezebel. Other people will be referred to by that name as, oh, you're Doubting Thomas. Isn't that something? That you, you got to see the Lord himself. You weren't a second generation apostle like Paul was you know, or Barnabas, but you were a first-generation apostle. You actually got to walk with the Lord. And your name throughout generations, <laughs> according to people, is Doubting Thomas. We see in, we can see in the Word how um, you can see where people are in the word. Most of, uh, who are the three main apostles you read about in the book of Acts that actually walk with the Lord? Peter, James, and John. And it makes you wonder, what were the rest of them doing? Like, what, what were the rest of them doing? Were they doing miracles too? Everybody understand? The last time we read about, as far as we know, the last time we read about Thomas was when he was named as one of the 11 in the book of Acts, and they had to replace Judas. And so they named the 11 apostles that were still alive, and then they, they, they went over the scripture that said that he had to be replaced. You know, that was prophesied in the Old Testament that he would, someone else would take his bishopric. So they then cast lots to decide who would do that, you see. But that's the last time you see Thomas really being mentioned. You don't read about him doing great miracles or anything like that. What is he known for? Being a doubter. Now, if, if you may think that uh, that's unfair. We read about this one time. Let's, let, in fact, let's read that, the 20th chapter of the book of John. And we're going to start reading at verse 19. John 20 and 19. It says, Then the same day at evening being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, 
came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. So everybody see what happened there? That the doors were shut, but the Lord appeared in the middle of them. In other words, he just appeared out of nowhere. Peace be unto you, verse 20. And when he had so said, where am I hearing that echo from? Turn that off. Turn that off. That. Joshua, turn that off. It's on the left side, yeah. All right. So verse 20 says, And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad. Nobody's dialed in, are they? Okay, we just got an echo in here. That's because that's turned off. Huh? Okay. All right. I guess that's all we can do. <laughs> Y'all just going to have to hear me twice. So verse 20 says, And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Everybody see that? So we, now most of you, you, you know what happened before this, that Jesus Christ, he, um, told a few women, go tell his disciples to meet him in a certain place. And when they came to them, to tell them, they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was alive. And so here, the Lord is bearing witness he, he appears before them. He shows uh, his hands, and he shows uh, his side. And then the Bible says, look at what that says, then were the disciples glad. Everybody see that? Now, uh, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of disciples are we going to be? Let's go ahead and keep reading. We'll get to that in a little bit. When they saw the Lord, then Jesus said unto said to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I, what? You. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye, what? Now, I want to stop right there. We're going to get on to something just real briefly. So when we read this, when did the disciples receive the Holy Ghost? Huh? When he breathed on them. Now, that's very important for you to understand that. They received the Holy Ghost when he breathed on them. You know why? Because he was the Holy Spirit. That's the reason why he could appear and disappear when he felt like it. Now, I'm, I'm saying this for a reason. Then he goes, he, he tells his disciples to meet him in a certain place, and, and he tells them to remain there and wait until the Holy Ghost come up on you. Now, it's very important that you understand the difference there. And I, I can't remember now if I preached it. If I haven't, it's been in the vault for so long, I guess. You know, I can't remember now if the Lord have released me to preach that yet or not. Have I preached on that? That there's a difference between you having the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost coming upon you. When you are born again, you are born, like what the Lord said, you are born of his spirit. You receive the Holy Ghost when you are born again. That's how you're born again, by, by the spirit. Everybody understand? So there's a difference. Now, what our Pentecostal brothers and sisters are doing 
is they're trying to make everybody have the same experience they had in, in Acts chapter 2. Everybody understand? When the Holy Ghost came upon them in, in Acts chapter 2, what did they do? They spoke in tongues. But what, but let's, but what, did, what were they really doing? They were preaching in another language. The Lord said, you shall receive power from on high. Power for what? To do what I've called you to do. Every time I stand up here, the Holy Ghost come upon me. But it's not upon me all the time. But it's in me all the time. Does everybody see the difference there? When you become born again, you receive the Spirit of God. So, but in your life, when God wants to use you in a powerful way, then that Holy Ghost comes upon you and it makes you Superman. Does everybody understand? So that's, that's the difference there. They received the Holy Ghost when the Lord was still present in this earth. But he told them, as my father sent me, so I send you. In other words, you're going to need something extra because you don't know all these the different languages of the world. You're going to have to have power to do that. that whole, in other words, I'm going to have to come up on you. Does everybody understand? So, and, and let me just hit this home. The Bible refers to that as being baptized with the Holy Ghost. Isn't that right? Being baptized. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you are baptized? So, when I baptized you, did I make you drink that water? So the water wasn't in you. Were you trying to gulp it down when you went under? So where was the water? All around you. Not on the inside of you, all around you. So when the Bible says we are baptized with the Holy Ghost, that means he's around you to perform, basically to take over your body and do what he wants to do with it. Does everybody see the difference? That there's a difference between being filled with the Holy Ghost on the inside and being baptized with him on the outside. When you're baptized, it's for outward purposes. You know, um, so if we look at it that way, in the book of Acts, that was not the first time people of God were baptized with the Holy Ghost. So does everybody understand what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is now? So then let's go, let's go back. What happened when uh, Elijah prophesied that it was going to rain? He looked up and saw a cloud and he knew it was about, it was God's about to send a rain. What happened? The Holy Ghost came upon him and what did he do? He outran horses. All through the prophets, you see in the book of Ezekiel, the, what, it, what was Ezekiel saying? The Holy Ghost came upon me and I found myself in a certain place. Or the Holy Ghost came upon me and stood me up and took me to a certain place. Everybody see? These men were bat being baptized. The Holy Ghost would come up. They would say, the Holy Ghost came upon me and I prophesied or I spoke. You, everybody see? Anytime the power of God came upon somebody, they were baptized. Does everybody see? All right, so we just wanted to say that. So verse 23, well, let's read verse 22 again. It says, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Does everybody understand what that means? That means they had power to make a person, to basically to keep them where they were. If they, if they got out of line with God, they could, they could choose to retain or remit. In other words, if, if you get out of line with me as an apostle, I can say, well, your sins be upon you. And, and they will be. That, that was the power that they had. That's another message. So verse 24. But Thomas, 
One of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. Everybody see that? Now, what is this showing us? There is a witness there. There is a witness there. By this time, it's, it's done got down to the grandchildren, the third generation. The women saw the Lord, and a couple other people saw the Lord, and they told the disciples. The disciples didn't believe it. And then the Lord showed himself to them, and then they were happy. Okay, now we believe you raised from the dead. Up until then, what were they? Depressed. But the Bible says Thomas wasn't with them. Now, here is the thing. This is where we're getting to. The things I preach, you're not with me when I receive them. And the Lord expects for you to take his word. Everybody understand? So verse 25, it says, The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. In other words, they were testifying. So imagine it's like this. They're actually preaching. We've seen the Lord. But look at what Thomas says. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, what? I will not believe. Does everybody see that? Does everybody see the problem with that? Is it very important? So I want you to think about this. They were around each other for about three and a half years. Thomas knew the character of those other apostles. He knew that they were not liars. Judas had already killed himself, so that wiped out that whole thing. The rest of them had integrity, and he knew that. And God intended, I want you to think about something. The Lord showed up when Thomas wasn't there. He could have waited a few minutes when Thomas would get there. But he showed up when Thomas was not there. You know why? Because it, the same way the Lord would give me his messages without you being there. He wants you to know how to trust who he sends. And you think about it. These disciples, they didn't have, they weren't, they didn't have the, this to read like what we read it today. People had to go off of their word. Everybody understand? They had to, they preached, what, it, what they preached was the word. Everybody understand? So it wasn't, they didn't have, he, Thomas couldn't say, well, show me Bible for that. I need, to see, I need to see that in the word. Even though that's what he was saying in his heart. I need to see that for myself is what he was saying. And we have a lot of people that that's, way, that's that way in, in churches today across the world. I need to see that for myself. And the Lord, now listen, I know we live in a day where there are so many false prophets where people want to see it. But you know, if you have that mindset, you know, even the Bible won't be enough. Does everybody understand? You know, the Lord had been preaching um, that I'm going to be killed by the Jews, but on the third day I'm going to be raised again. That should have been enough. So that shows us that he didn't even trust the Lord and what the Lord was saying. Everybody understand? So let's look at what he says there. I will not believe. In other words, if I don't see that for myself. Now, here's the thing. Did him saying that and, and not seeing. So say, for instance, if the Lord had not appeared to Thomas, would that have made the Lord Jesus Christ dead? You know, God's word is true whether we believe it or not. It's true whether we believe it or not. You know, God, the Bible says God can't deny himself. It's true whether we believe it or not. 
And so we have to get to the point where we, where we trust who God sends to reveal his word. Because I'm going to tell you, it'll get to the point, and I'm going to tell you why. Because our obedience even supersedes what's written here. It's not written anywhere in here for me to move to Meeting, Tennessee and start a church. Not anywhere. I can't find that nowhere in this Bible. But if you're doubting Thomas, you're going to want to find a Bible for it or you'll be able to back out of God's plan for you. Everybody see? That's where the devil takes that. Listen, nothing wrong with wanting to see things in God's word. But when, if that's the only thing that will satisfy you, then you get to the point where you can disobey God when he gives you something personal for you to do that's not written. Everybody see? So that's the danger of that. So he says, I will not believe. Verse 26, and after how many days? Eight days. He could have chose to believe it then. But after eight days again, his disciples were within. Everybody see that? Thomas with them and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus. Now, <laughs> eight days. I hope you really, really get where we're going here today. Eight days. The Lord knew about that conversation before it happened. But he waited eight days. You know that's what happens when you don't just believe it from the jump? The Lord might not ever come back around. He might not ever come back around. And so let's, so let's say, for instance, the grace of God is there and he show up for you after eight days. You have to ask yourself, what was the devil doing and planting those eight days I was walking in unbelief? Everybody see? Eight days is a long time. That's, that's plenty of time for the devil to plot and plan on your unbelief. Everybody see? <laughs> Verse 26, and after eight days again, his disciples were within, or in, in other words, inside, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Verse 29, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet do what? The Bible says in this same book, the first chapter, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was who? God. So Jesus, what is Jesus saying here? You're blessed when it don't, when it don't take you seeing, again, seeing it in my word to believe it. Does everybody understand? I can't tell you the number of times I've preached something and said things that I didn't know was in God's word until later on. It, just, it, it happens all the time. I say something, and then later on I see, oh, okay, so that, that's in your word. But it comes with me. I just have to trust that God is standing up here with me and preaching through me. He know what he's saying. So he said, blessed are they that have not seen, and yet what? So we see the mercy of God. Let's go now. And you may say, well, you know what? That's just one story. Why are we calling him Doubting Thomas? Now, I don't refer to him as that. But, you know, I've heard people refer to him as that, Doubting Thomas, and refer to people that walk in unbelief about anything, Doubting, doubting Thomases. Why do we, you know, you don't get to this point, and I'm going to show you that's in the Bible. You don't get to this point, because this was the coup de grace here. In other words, the finale. 
you don't get to that point without it being evident in other areas. It, th this was not the first time he had an issue with what was being said. Let's, let's go look at that. Let's go to the 11th chapter of the book of John. So this, this is what we're getting at today. If we have unbelief in God about God's word in any area, that's really just indicative of where we are in the Lord to begin with. The 11th chapter of the book of John, let's start reading at verse 1. It says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Now, the first thing I want to point out is how did they refer, how did his sisters refer to Lazarus to Jesus, the one whom you love? You know what they were saying in our language is your best friend. Your best friend is sick. But what was Jesus' response to that? Yeah, okay, that's cool. But I'm going to stay here for two more days. I'm, I'm staying here for two more days. So you see why it's important that we have faith in God? Because your emergency don't mean, don't make God speed up about anything. He moves in his own time. Everybody understand? It's an emergency for you. But the real emergency is that you learn to trust God and allow God to move in his own time. All right. Verse seven, then after that, said he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? But Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. I want you to see the, the dialogue back and forth. Because all these years they've been with the Lord and they're still not in tune with the way he taught. At what point did the Lord ever go wake anybody up out of natural sleep? Everybody see? <laughs> Even his disciples, when he came and found them sleep, he said, sleep on. <laughs> so they should have known what he was talking about. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. <laughs> Verse 15, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may what? Because if I was there, you'd have a hard time believing. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. So you, everybody understand why he said that to them? I'm glad for your sakes I was not there to the intent you may believe. Uh, let me share with you why. Because the Jews at this time, and some of them still believe this, that when a person, they believe that when a person died, that their spirit remained around their body for three days trying to get back in. And that's why he waited two more days, and it was another couple of days before he got there, so that it would be four days. He didn't, because think about it, up until that point, 
he, if somebody would die, he'd go right to their body and raise them from the dead. And so the devil would give them any excuse not to believe. Well, you know, the body, the, he wasn't really dead anyway. The spirit was still, hadn't gone into eternity. It was still around the body trying to get back in. And, you know, to this day, you, you, you still read in the news people being declared dead in some kind of way, being in the morgue and waking up. And they, the world will do anything but give God glory, won't they? <laughs> no, we're not going to say God had mercy and raised the person from the dead. We'll just say the spirit of the man was just lingering around and it just got back in some kind of way. <laughs> and so Jesus knew about this fairy tale. <laughs> and he said, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you'll have a chance to believe. So let's read that again, verse 15. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said who? Which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples. Let us also go, that, me, that we may what? Because not only is he not going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he's a dead man walking himself. And don't he, the Lord ain't got no sense. I want you to think about what had to be inside of him for him to say that. The Lord had already declared, this is not, this is for the glory of God. God's going to be glorified. He's already declared, I'm going to raise him from the dead. But what is Thomas saying? You ain't going to do it. Not only are you not going to, you, you don't have power to raise a man from the dead. You don't have power to keep yourself alive. So, since you want to be crazy, I guess we'll go and be crazy with you. And he probably really thought he was saying something extra spiritual. I'm, we gonna, in this moment, the Lord is weak and he don't know what he's doing, but we're going to show our loyalty to him. Let's go die with him. <laughs> you already dead. Isn't that something? that come from a place of pride. Here it is, my God have said something, and I'm going to say something different. I, and in fact, I'm, and I'm going to get brownie points for having empathy for you, because you don't even have enough sense to know what's about to happen. <laughs> so that's Thomas chapter 1. Let's go look at Thomas chapter 2, the 14th chapter of the book of John. <laughs> Fourteen chapter of the book of John. Let's start reading at verse 1. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his death. And he's telling them what's going to happen and things like that. And so then he goes on in verse 1. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now let's read verse 4 very carefully. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Isn't that plain? Where I'm going, you know. And, and how to get there, you also know. Who said that? But, let's, but who? Verse 5, what does that start with? What did he say unto the Lord? We know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? No, that doubt didn't start with hands and fingers. Everybody see? What did his God just tell him? Where I go, you know, and you also know how to get there. And he came right behind him and said, we don't know, how to, we don't know where you're going. And so how can we know how to get there? Isn't that something? And so he couldn't believe the small things. He could not believe what we just read, 
Even after he had just been told, the devil didn't, you know, two weeks hadn't passed and the devil just got to his brain about it and, 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 you know, he just got lost. He had just heard it and it was his job to believe it. But that was in him to begin with. So let me say this. When we doubt the Lord, you know what it really means? We know more than him. Or we think we do. That's what doubt is. Does everybody understand? And so the, then the question is, what is it that I know that's causing me to doubt? Do you know it has to be something else present for you to doubt something? I already have to have my mind made up about one thing for me to doubt another. Because other than that, there's no reason for me to doubt. If nothing else, if I, can't, if I don't have something else to weigh it against, then there's no reason for me to doubt. So that means I got something else to weigh it against. I got something, it's something there to cause me to doubt. Does everybody understand? So then it's not enough to say, okay, well, Lord, forgive me for doubting. We have to figure out, Lord, what is, what is planted on the inside of me that's getting in the way of me believing Let's go, let's go real quick to the 20th chapter of 2 Chronicles. And then we'll share something with you. Uh, 2 Chronicles 20 and 20. So in the, in the 20th chapter of the book of 2 Chronicles, what you see is Judah has been invaded by three different kingdoms, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Edomites. And they were overtaken. And Jehoshaphat, who was a righteous king, he had prayed to God and asked God what to do about it. How, how can we get past this? And the Lord answered Jehoshaphat's prayer through a prophet. And so what we see here, let's read verse 20. It says, And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe who? And so shall ye do what? So you see... What is he really saying? It's really one and the same. It's really one and the same. God is not going to show himself to everybody in the same way. Does everybody understand? Some of us, we will actually hear the voice of God like an audible voice. The rest of us, you hear the voice of man, which is the voice of God in an audible voice. I, and either way, this is what I'm saying, it's still the voice of God. And where sometimes we get off at is, you know, we follow this demonic doctrine of trust no man. How many of us have heard that mess? Trust no man. Uh, my question to you is this. How does God preach? Through men. Not even angels. Even angels don't preach. He preached through men. And so if you have a mindset of trust no man, how are you going to get to God? You know, and I, a lot of that stemmed from hurt. We done been hurt by man. 
Well, then we have to ask ourselves, where was the man spiritually when he, when he hurt us? You can't put that off on everybody. Everybody shouldn't have to start with you pulling up, you know, pulling themselves out of the mud and trying to prove to you. If you have a pure heart, you ought to start off believing people until they show you something different. Amen. And even when they show you something different, pray for them. Don't write them off forever. Everybody understand? Was David a prophet or not? So let's say we're living in David's time. And we've heard about this great prophet. I heard what you did. You slept with Bathsheba, got her pregnant. And then killed the woman's husband. And I'm supposed to follow you? <laughs> you think about it. How many of us would have a problem with a preacher standing up preaching to you week after week? And he done got some woman pregnant in his congregation and done killed her husband. <laughs> you know, the Lord sat him down. Oh, you, you, you've caused people to blaspheme. You know, you've, you've caused a reproach to be brought on my name, so I'm going to sit you down and put somebody else in your place for a little while. But then what happened? Who do, what do, my grandson there is named after him, King David. We call him King David. I'm talking about the king in his Bible. You know why? Because God made him king again. And to me, that's one of the things wrong with the body of Christ. We don't believe in restoring anybody. We forget what kind of mess we were in. You know you only one bad day from being flat on your back? You can't, God want us to love people. You know, I never drunk alcohol, never drunk it. But I tell you what, when I was going through it in my, in my first marriage, the, it, it came to me just as plain as day. I understand now how people get on it and get hooked on it. They trying to get out of whatever reality they are in. You know how I understood that? Because what I was going through at the time was so painful, I would go to sleep and dream everything was good. And then I hated waking up to, to reality of, man, I'm right back in this raggedy life that I was in yesterday. And then I understood, it's like the Lord gave me this epiphany. This is how people become drunkard. This is how people take on that alcoholic spirit and, and, and on drugs and everything else because they're trying to get out of the reality that the devil has painted for them. And so from experiences like that, you learn to love people because you, you, you can't judge somebody if you don't know where they've come from, what they've been through. And now me personally, I just feel like, well, you know what, Lord? I'm glad that you, you upheld me from falling into a whole lot of junk that the devil was trying to get me to fall into. So I, I can't look at a person where they are now and say, well, you know what? You, you, just pull yourself up. Pull yourself up. I was saved and sanctified when I was going through that, and that temptation had come, and I understood, you know what? If I didn't have the Holy Ghost, if I didn't have God, I would drop into that easily. So when we get saved, and when we start living for the Lord, when we get saved, God give us a lifeline that he intend for us to throw to other people. Amen. Everybody see? And don't ever say what you won't do. You ain't, been in, you ain't been there yet. You just ain't been tempted in that area yet. It, it, your circumstances hadn't been set up yet, but don't ever say what you won't do. Say, by the grace of God, Amen. by the grace of God, he'll keep me. But when we say what well, we won't do because we high and mighty, <laughs> you see.
So what are we saying? Don't, don't look at flesh. King David was called a man after God's own heart. That was his nickname, a man after God's own heart. And you know what that man did? He fornicated. He committed adultery. He murdered. God dealt with him and then restored him. Everybody see? We as believers, we have to learn, we have to, learn to see the end of people. Don't, don't judge people where they are now. Learn to see the end of them. You know what? You got, God can really use you. Think about it. What shape would this New Testament be in if God hadn't got somebody that was persecuting Christians? God didn't say, well, you know what? There's no hope for you. You ain't even got enough sense to keep your hands off of my people. No, you know what? I'm going to take all that energy you got and you're going to go around the world preaching exactly uh, what you were uh, bitterly against. And that's what I say. That's the way I believe it today. God takes delight in, 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 in getting folks that's got a bad reputation. For those of us that were born saved, God can't, what glory does God get out of that? <laughs> And you know what? I'm the type of person, I'm not going to be ashamed of the mud God pulled me out of. No, I'm not hiding. i tell you exactly what I used to do. Because I want you to see the power of God and what he can do, you see. So the last thing I want to share, just real briefly, some of you have noticed that uh, now, you know, and it may have been that way since you've gotten here, I don't know, but you may have noticed how a lot of times when you talk to me, I'll ask you to, what did you say? You know, I'll ask you to repeat yourself. How many of you noticed that? Shame on y'all for raising your hand. (laughs) (laughs) I'm pretend I didn't see that. I forgive (laughs) y'all. But you know, the Lord had brought something to my remembrance this morning on on the way to church. When I was growing up, I was just like a lot of young people. I liked music and I liked it loud. And if these type of speakers behind me wasn't good enough, I had to take those speakers, the condensed version, and put them in my ears. And I I had older people tell me, you shouldn't do that, you you can lose your hearing. And so that's what I was watching out for, okay, well, I'm gonna just turn my stuff down. I'm gonna just, you know, I'm not gonna have it blasted in my ears, busting my eardrums, I'm gonna just turn it down. And that's where I was looking for the devil at loud headsets. But when I was in the Navy, uh, I went to, the, went to uh, see what the, in the Navy they call them hospital corpsmen. They were like nurses or RNs or whatever, you know, but in the Navy, that was their rate, what they call them in the, in the Navy. And I can't remember why I went to see him, but uh, he was telling me, he said, whatever you do, and it might have been who he had just got finished seeing, he said, whatever you do, do not stick um, Q-tips in your ears to clean them out. How many of you heard that before? He said, don't do that. He said, because you think you're cleaning your ears out, but what you're really doing is pushing wax further in. And not only that, over time, parts, pieces of the Q-tips will get in there as well. The little cotton, you know, over time you just have little strands going in there. And after a while, you begin to lose your hearing. And so the Lord had brought that to my remembrance, that this is how his people can be. Up until a few days ago, I was still, every time I got out of the shower, I'm sticking Q-tips in my ear thinking, ooh, you know, praise the Lord, we got that demon out. <laughs> Cause
Because I'm thinking, because I'm seeing results on the Q-tip, I'm doing something good. I, so, you know, I'm going to keep my hearing. I done forgot, you know, I, I'm not playing loud music in my ears no more. I, I'm going to keep my hearing. And see, so you see what, what the devil will do for you. He had me paying attention to the loud music, and I completely forgot about the Q-tips. Still the same result. Don't have the hearing that I used to have. Everybody see? So what? I heard that man loud and clear. Don't stick Q-tips in your ear. But you know what my problem was? I didn't believe it. I did not believe it. Why? Because I was looking at the evidence. I'm seeing stuff come out on this Q-tip. So I, it must be doing some good. And I paid for it. That was about 25 years ago. And over time, over time, I began to notice I could not hear as good. You see? And that's what happens to us if we're not careful. We can overlook one thing because we're paying attention to something else. And over time, we get to the place where we can't hear God either. You see? And that's not God's will. That's not God's will at all. And, and so, something that small, and we can think that's a small thing. Don't, you know, don't stick Q-tips in your ear. We can think some of the things that we read in this Bible is just small things. It, it doesn't matter. It's just small. But you know what I say? If God thought enough of it to put it in his word, then we should think enough of it to obey it and to believe it. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that you've spoke to us today. Thank you, Lord, for making it plain to us and for opening our understanding, Lord, concerning your word. Lord, we ask if there's anything that we've gotten off the path with, if there's anything that we didn't believe, Lord, when we heard it, we ask that you will jog our memory, Lord, and bring it back to our remembrance so that we can go back and correct and believe what you've told us. Help us, Lord, not to take these things for lightly, the things that we hear on a regular basis. Help us, Lord, to uh, know your voice and to hear your voice and to believe the things that you tell us, Lord. Lord, right now I pray for every individual in here that's under the sound of my voice. Lord, wherever they're hurting at in their bodies or in their hearts, Lord, I ask that you will heal them completely. I come against every spirit that's not of you today. God, I pray for those that may have bitterness or unforgiveness in their hearts, Lord. I ask that you will remove that dark cloud from them. That you will help them to release whatever hurt that they may have, Lord. All of the baggage, Lord, that the devil piled on top of them when they were out in the world, Lord, I ask that you will remove it today. Lord, I ask that you will open up blinded eyes, not just naturally, but spiritually, Lord. Open up their eyes. Give us all, Lord, a heart of forgiveness to forgive our fellow man. Give us a heart of love, Lord, to love people the way that you love them. To love them enough, Lord, to want to be an example of, of you in this earth, Lord. Help us to lead people to you by our lifestyle and the words that we speak, Lord, that are not contrary to your word. Help us to lead people to you, Lord, by the things we uh, do in our bodies. Help us to live holy like you've called us to live. Help us, Lord, to get out of self and flesh. Help us to look on the things of others, Lord, and, and to, to want to help people, Lord, the way that you've called us to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. So if that's all now, we'll go ahead and dismiss you. Y'all know the routine. If the Lord say the same, we'll meet back up at 2 o'clock.